Can you tell us what a moderate Republican is? <laughs> yeah, does anybody have a picture of Mitt Romney? <laughs> it's, it's, and I, I understand that, as Joe was saying, a representative, whether they're in the House or the Senate, they have an obligation to represent the views and the values of their constituents. Mm -hmm. right. It's very important. And I worked when I was in the House with a number of Republicans, Republican House members, who were from districts that were very different from where we sit here, which was part of my district. And that was reflected in their votes. And I understood that. They were reflecting the views and values of their constituents. And their views of the Second Amendment, wrong as they might have been, were what they felt, what they believed in. So I understand that to some extent. Uh, not, uh, not that you have to reflect the views and values of your constituents if you, in fact, do not understand and do not share those. And you have a, a, an independent obligation to say so and to make that clear to your constituents. So you're not going to go up there and vote against your values. Hopefully through our electoral process, you have those two are co-joined. In other words, the values and views of your constituents and the values and views of you as the representative, as the, as the candidate. But uh, essentially, what we're seeing with uh, people like Mitt Romney and Susan Collins and uh, Lisa Murkowski, Murkowski is one that I don't understand because Alaska is not a conservative state, I mean, not a liberal state. Right? Uh, Maine, yeah, you do have a lot of liberals in Maine. Uh, Utah, I'm not that familiar with, but I've always thought of Utah as, you know, fairly conservative. But uh, these so-called moderate Republicans, uh, I think, simply are those that fail to distinguish between fundamental constitutional principles and political views of their constituents or others that are trying to influence them. The question of whether or not to allow witnesses is a very simple one. The question of whether or not to allow additional evidence is a very simple one. It's not the job of the Senate sitting as a trier of an impeached president to consider matters and evidence that was not a part of the House's impeachment process. So, to say, well, you know, maybe, maybe we need uh, to open all of this up. Uh, and the house, the house managers were allowed to go into a lot of stuff that I would not have allowed them to go into that had that were not in the house record. You know, this 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 guy's left harness. I mean, I don't care about. I mean, have you seen pictures of this guy? But, but he's this Ukrainian American operative. You know, and you look at him, and you know, he might as well have a neon sign that says, "I am not trustworthy." <laughs> he sits there and babbles about this stuff that's nonsensical, and the Democrats think, "Ah, oh, this is uh, this is this is the key witness." You know, this is the Perry Mason uh, uh, key witness, the surprise witness. These mod so-called moderate Republicans here are not moderate Republicans in the sense that they represent constituents that have thought through and have a different view of the basic constitutional principles. They just are individuals that don't have the courage to stand up to fundamental principle and very clear laws and regulations. And in, in Romney's case, I think it's just that you know, he doesn't like Trump. And this gives him an opportunity to uh, make that very clear. Um, the alternative media has thrown out a lot of interesting things. Um, they they rather fly in the face of some of the things you've just said. But they're talking about bringing in other uh, witnesses, such as the Bidens and, and uh, other deep state miscreants. Any comment from you on that aspect? In, in, in the House, whenever we would have a hearing, and it's the same whether you know the Democrats or the Republicans in charge, traditionally and historically, 
the majority party allows the minority party to have witnesses at a hearing. The majority party may always has in the past maintained the power to have more witnesses. So if you have a panel of uh, six witnesses, the majority party would have four and the minority party would be given two, for example. Uh, this notion now that the House managers are, and uh, Ms. Pelosi are advocating, that uh, we, the House managers, should be able to call witnesses to buttress our case, uh, one, it's not necessary and it's inconsistent with, with precedent, but that any Republican would entertain the notion that, okay, they'll let them call witnesses uh, without demanding that the White House be allowed to have at least as many witnesses, if not more, uh, is, is just, I mean, it's childish in, 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 in how silly it is or how, how inconsistent it is. Uh, first of all, I don't think that there is any need for any witnesses. Secondly, uh, this notion that what the Bidens did, and they, they, they were operating as a team, it wasn't just Hunter Biden, uh, it was a team. The Vice President of the United States and his son uh, were operating to further corruption and engender corruption in Ukraine uh, that had to do with USA. So if anything is relevant, that certainly is. Uh, <coughs> Yet the, the House managers try and you know, make this argument, and they do it with a straight face. I give them credit for that. They, they make ridiculous arguments <laughs> with a straight face. Uh, you know, this, this notion that uh, uh, it's irrelevant what was going on in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, that precipitated or caused the President of the United States to have concerns about release of further aid without ensuring that the corruption was taken care of or at least being addressed is nonsense. So uh, you know, whether, whether or not uh, John Bolton testifies, uh, the separate question is whether or not, uh, if any witness testifies, uh, the White House is still allowed to assert a privilege uh, that certain information remains privileged uh, under uh, the doctrine of executive privilege or national security or whatever. Yeah, you know, the fact that a witness, John Bolton, for example, is no longer employed by the executive branch, and therefore the assertion of executive privilege doesn't apply is nonsense. Yeah. It doesn't have anything to do with the person's position. It has to do with the information, the evidence. And if, in fact, the White House, the administration, believes that if Bolton is called, uh, he can, should be allowed or permitted uh, to testify as to anything, and the White House should not be able to assert uh, privilege against his testimony, again, is inconsistent with ba basic notions of law and precedent of executive privilege. Certainly, uh, the White House needs to be able to assert that to protect information that has to do either with national security or with confidential communications between a president and his advisors which actually goes back to, you'll remember this, uh, an 1803 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, Marbury v. Madison. In that case, there was extensive discussion by Chief Justice John Marshall drawing a distinction between a decision that a president makes that is simply administrative and, and pursuant to his job and receiving advice. They didn't use the term executive privilege, but even going back to 1803, there is Supreme Court precedent for recognizing that certain categories of information and activities are shielded from public disclosure. Now, the term executive privilege didn't come into use until, actually, I think President Eisenhower in the 1950s, but the principle has been there going back 216 years. Uh, so, one, I don't think witnesses are necessary. No witnesses ought to be called that uh, whose testimony was not already part of the House proceedings. In other words, that's harness, although I can't imagine that 
the Democrat, the House managers who really want this guy to testify. And, uh, I think the, the, House, the White House lawyers would just tear him apart. But uh, executive privilege remains, and but for the Chief Justice being so concerned about occurring to be nice with everybody, uh, it should be a, a pretty clear question that the Senate should, should reject. <coughs> Bob, based on <coughs> your extensive experience in politics and as a practicing attorney, what are the chances that the Senate as a whole would remove the president? Zero. Well, let me. You, know, you, you should never say that. Ninety-nine point nine percent, they did not. What? Uh, and, and the Democrats know this. I mean, when when Schiff says, I mean, he telegraphed the whole purpose of this thing. It's to influence the election, mm -hmm. and they're already they they have so little confidence, not only in their case, but in their electoral chances in November. That Schiff, when he said the other day that uh, we need to remove the president because if we don't, we won't be able to uh, be assured that the election next year will be fair. Now they're already <laughs> admitting that they're going to lose, and they're already laying the groundwork for their excuse. Well, we didn't remove the president, and he cheated on this election in 2020. Uh, that's all that it's about, and I, I, I cannot imagine that. The, the Democrats would get uh, a sufficient number of Republicans to remove the president, but further damage can be done if they actually allow this thing to drag out further and allow new evidence to come in. Not that it will change the final outcome, but it, but it, it just will give the Democrats more opportunity you know, to keep repeating their mantras over and over and over again, and it's designed purely and simply to influence the coming election. Yes. Knowing the propaganda parade that the Democrats have given us for the last three years, do you think possibly their strategy with, with demanding witnesses at the Senate hearing is to carry this on out? So if the Senate rules, then they have a legitimate um, situation they've been setting up to go back and just keep it going until November 2020. They will. They'll continue to use every tool that they have. Um, I don't know whether you saw Maxine Waters the other day. Uh, I can't. Uh, saying, you know, saying very clearly, yeah, we're not going to let this thing lie. We're, we're going to go back regardless of what happens in the Senate. We're, we're just going to keep at this. And they will. They'll just keep at it. Now, will they hurt themselves eventually? Yes, I think so. But. Their view of the universe is very different from ours. You know, there's this, you know, this bizarro world out there where you know, <laughs> up is down and black is white and yes is no and so forth. They don't, they don't see the real world. Neither do so their voters. That, 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 it, and it goes back to education. There are a lot of voters out there that do not have the proper understanding any of these issues, whether it's procedural or substantive, they really don't. Bob, um, first of all, again, thanks for everything you've been doing for 20 years. Um, I remember I met you first when that Waco trial, uh, you, were, you were back then on that committee. Um, I was, since we're talking about witnesses, I was wondering if you could go back and recap the three witnesses that were deposed. And as I recall, there were defense witnesses. Well, it's Monica, how, how, how uh, Sidney Blumenthal, and Bernie Jordan right. were the three witnesses. So how did that? How was? How did they decide um, which of uh, which witnesses to call and who who wanted them and that sort of thing? Well, the the Senate the Senate uh, decided. And again, this was late in the trial. They decided. They said, "Well, okay, you can depose you, the House managers. It was us." You can depose three witnesses under these very tight restrictions, and you can choose. So uh, 
you got to have we the house managers decided that you know those would be the three that we could you know that were the best to try and put a little bit of sort of muscle on the skeleton of obstruction primarily the obstruction of justice and the perjury was so so clear we really wanted witnesses that we could try and show specifically through word of mouth through live witnesses, the instruction, the efforts in which the president engaged to try and get Monica a job through Vernon Jordan, uh, the manner in which the president had uh, tried to convince her not to testify truthfully or not to testify. Those were the three witnesses that we chose to try and buttress the case on the obstruction of justice. As I say, because the perjury was so self-evident anyway. Did you have an opportunity to call him in the house? Because I know, I know Ken Starr had most of the investigation. Stand up so people can see. Did you have an opportunity to call him in the house? Or uh, I know Ken Starr presented most of the information. Yeah, we, we, we could have called additional witnesses. What we focused on in, in the house hearings in the Judiciary Committee, and none of the other committees, the, the House Judiciary Committee is the one, the only committee in the house, in my view, that should be involved in an impeachment inquiry. It's the only committee in the House that has specific jurisdiction to issue articles of impeachment to the full House. But I think uh, the manner in which the Speaker has allowed the House Intelligence Committee to be the key committee does tremendous damage to intelligence oversight. Because now you have the one committee of the House that was set up, and I and I helped draft the legislation back in the late 1970s when I was doing legislative work for the agency, drafted that legislation to provide effective oversight of intelligence activities uh, of the intelligence community by the House and the Senate. We set up the House Intelligence Committee, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, specifically in a way that, and with the, the, the jurisdiction, to carry out intelligence oversight in as nonpartisan a way as possible. So you have the one committee of the House that was set up to be as nonpartisan as possible because of the unique nature of monitoring the intelligence community. Uh, now, in the forefront of the most partisan activity in which a house, the House could engage. So I think they not only has the Speaker and the Democrats in the House done great damage to the principle of impeachment, also to uh, the uh, process of intelligence oversight by what they've done. But we could we could have at the in the House Judiciary Committee called witnesses, but the witnesses that we did call were those that established the importance of perjury and obstruction as being high crimes and misdemeanors, being serious criminal offenses. Uh, and then we relied uh, on Ken Starr's, not only his report, but he testified for 12 or 15 hours, I forget how long it was, it went into great detail uh, with regard to all of the evidence that he had accumulated, including that relating to both the perjury and the obstruction. So the question I have is more wrapped around response. For, for people. What tools of immediate effect would we as people have in fighting this ridiculousness that's going on in Washington? I know we have elections, uh, but that's not an immediate effect tool. You're, you're months and years out from doing anything with an election. Uh, you know, and we don't control the election of shift in Cobb County. What, what other tools do we have other than to sit here and take it? Uh, and, and try to mitigate some of this nonsense that's going on in, in our capital city. Certainly through the, through the ballot box, uh, we can defeat shift directly. Uh, I don't know who, his, his district, uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but he, he was originally elected in 2000, I think, uh, defeating Jim Rogan, uh, who was one of the impeachment managers. Uh, and uh, 
his district is extremely liberal. Burbank. It's been gerrymandered. Pardon? Burbank. Burbank. Yeah, yeah. Burbank. Yeah. It used to come down into the Rodeo Drive area or something, but anyway, a very liberal district. So I don't know who his opponent is going to be, and probably doesn't matter anyway, the way they redistrict it. Uh, but there, there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, I know Michael and some of you all write letters to the paper. You have the opportunity to, to pen opinion pieces for newspapers. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations out there, other than simply the Republican Party, uh, that collectively can really uh, help out to present these kind of arguments. So for example, on Second Amendment issues, I uh, serve on the NRA board, but a lot of us probably are members of the NRA or other Second Amendment advocacy groups. Uh, so collectively, these organizations can do a lot more than each one of us can individually. So I think it's important for us to identify those organizations uh, that stand for these principles. Uh, the Institute for Justice, for example, is, is, is one of them. Jay Sekulow's group, the, uh, the American Center for Law and Justice, and so forth. So I think it's important to use whatever resources we have to support those organizations uh, that collectively can, uh, uh, can give voice to this. Uh, I think it's important to go to town hall meetings. Uh, are, are we in, this is Loudermilk's district, right? Where we yeah. are here, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's important to go to uh, his town hall meetings. I presume you know, Barry has town hall meetings. Uh, and you know, make your voice known, raise these issues. Uh, if you live in Lucy McBath's district, uh, <laughs> you know, it's important then to go to the town hall meetings. And if you have an opportunity to raise these issues, ask questions about it. Uh, she doesn't ask. It's, it's, it's important in whatever form it is. Uh, it's also important you know, to have Bob Bob. Now, Bob Bob, or a county commissioner, is not in their official work, doesn't involve themselves directly in political matters involving Washington. But by electing people like Bob, uh, who stand for the same principles, so people can see it at the local level, a responsible government that hopefully operates within you know, the parameters of you know, our conservative Republican principles. That helps. Uh, so it's not just electing members of Congress that understand these things and operate that according to you know, fundamental constitutional principles, but people at the local government level and the state level as well. Other than that, I think it's you know, all of us come in contact during the course of uh, any day uh, with probably dozens of people. Uh, and whatever opportunity you have to talk about these things, even if it's just kind of briefly with somebody that you meet, certainly with family, I think it's important to remind people how important these things are and to educate them. Uh, we need school boards. At the, in, at the state and the local level that understand how important it is to, that it's more important to teach civics and constitution than LGBTQ uh, nonsense. Uh, I might reveal my prejudice there against teaching, but to me it's a lot more important to teach American history and civics uh, than it is a lot of the nonsense that our schools teach. And that's not just something we can do at the local level with our local school board, but at the state level also, mm -hmm. to elect the governor and lieutenant uh, governor that's, that understand the value of education and making sure that in our educational system, we stress those things that are important to our country, not just to particular interest groups. I'm not sorry, doing what? A million people in, in D.C. protesting wouldn't hurt either. No, uh, exact, exactly right. I mean, we saw the uh, uh, March for Life uh, yesterday. Uh, that, there, there are groups like that, uh, organizations and grassroots, organiza grassroots groups that do that. It's important to participate. You're right. Uh, I would like your opinion. There are alleged crimes of the Clintons, of Joe Biden, and Hunter Biden. Will we ever see prosecutions for those alleged crimes? We 
I'm not optimistic. Uh, I wish it were otherwise. I had a group called Liberty Guard. And this is one of the things that we've been advocating in our mailers and, and the work that we do uh, to you know, have a special prosecutor appointed to look into those. Uh, I think they're very serious. <coughs> foundations, for example. Uh, but it, it does not appear that the Department of Justice is going in that direction. Now, there is, uh, with regard to uh, the U.S. Attorney that uh, uh, my namesake, Bill Barr, has appointed, uh, St. Dunham, I think, or Durham, uh, to uh, look into uh, some of these matters, which are very important, uh, such as the abuse of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. That is, that is frightening what uh, they, the uh, the prior administration, but even the, under the Bush administration, Bush too, uh, misusing the surveillance powers of the government in violation of federal law, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the courts were just complicit in uh, failing to adequately review these applications for FISA warrants and allowing these things to continue. Uh, were it not for the Carter Page uh, abuse, and that now coming to light, we probably wouldn't uh, see any possibility of reform there. But it's very worrisome that even with the clear abuse of the FISA process that we now know about, and there's, you know, there's always a lot more that we don't know about, but we know that there was a very clear abuse of it, uh, there, there still does not appear to be sufficient impetus in the Congress to reform, to really reform FISA. And it does need some very serious uh, reform, some fundamental reform. So uh, trying to get Congress to <coughs> tackle you know, these very important, may not, you know, they, talking about FISA is difficult with people because it's a, it's a complex procedure and, and you don't want to say, well, we're not, we don't, it's not that we don't support national security and robust intelligence capability, but you need to do it in accord with the Fourth Amendment, for example. Uh, so the administration, this administration, despite a lot of the good things that they've been doing, they, they don't seem to be really interested in tackling uh, the, uh, the, the abuses by the Clinton Foundation uh, or the abuses by uh, the former vice president, which were very, uh, they rose to violations of federal law they very clearly were highly unethical. Uh, but the Clinton Foundation, I mean, there are criminal violations there that should be looked into. But I'm not optimistic that they will be. I'd just like to say that um, everybody here would appreciate you coming in and explaining to us some of the procedures that are going on in D.C. And the point that you made earlier about people need to understand most of us, all of us, will defend the Constitution. But a lot of us need to understand better the Constitution. I think the way to do that, again, is through education. What can we do in this district to promote the causes of this district? And I think that if we have the right type of representative in Washington that will stand fast with the President on issues that concern the 6th Congressional District, educate every community to the level we need to, I think is great. My wife and I do kids' books. We started third grade all the way up to middle school. <clears throat> Civic's been out of school since I left. That's been a long time ago. <laughs> we need, I think, to re-emphasize the need for civics in our school. And we need to re-emphasize the need for prayer back in our school. So thank you for hitting on those in education or we can do with our representatives that we send to Washington, but they keep their word when they get there. I'm not as optimistic as you seem to be. I thought one of the most important comments that you made, Bob, was this attempt by a huge portion of our government that is attempting to destroy the very, your words, the very fabric of our Constitution, the values 
the freedoms that we enjoy. They're attacking it. And they're getting stronger and stronger in their attacks. And we seem to be getting weaker and weaker. I don't have any confidence whatsoever in the educational system and our ability to change it. Think about what's going on in our university system, from which I retired after many, many years. I, I was, when I started, they were educating young people properly, not only with respect to civics and history and technical matters, to today, where they're teaching socialism. What's bad about our country? And these same young people eventually go into teaching. And what do they teach? Social. They teach exactly what they learned and what they seem to believe. I see our country moving in a direction of becoming an Orwellian society. George, Ell George Orwell made an a, a, a remarkable prediction of how a society can evolve into a 1984 society. So the question to you is, and, and then also, what happens when the majority of voters, and there may be certain groups that are increasing in population faster than other groups, which will go unnamed, become the majority. And then they vote to completely change the nature of our country That's right. and the nature of our constitution. What then? In the worst possible scenario, if the Democrats take the presidency, the House, and the Senate, what then do we have available to us? It's not as easy as you were suggesting, and not, certainly not as optimistic as I know you would like it to be. I don't feel that way. I feel scared as hell. Something more has to be done, and it may involve don't say it. Or could it involve <laughs> violence? Yeah. There's a word for that. We were involved in such yeah. many, many years ago in our founding. That may be the only thing left to change. I don't know how you maintain your, your, your sanity <laughs> in a government where half of them are totally insane. Yeah. And they don't seem to care about us. You clearly have and do. President Trump certainly has and does. I don't really care how he speaks, by the way. I was born in that same city. I understand how he speaks. I enjoy how he speaks. He speaks like the people speak. So what, what, what do you think would happen in a worst possible case? We were overtaken in the majority who think socialism is good, and ultimately communism, and free everything. What do us in the minority then do? I sure would appreciate your thoughts on <laughs> that worst possible case. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> How do you really the, the, most, the most difficult job that I have in my mind every day is waking up and not having at least some sense of optimism that our history, our people, our constitution is strong enough to avoid what you're talking about. It is difficult to remain optimistic and it's becoming more difficult. But I, I still think that there is a, a wellspring of understanding and goodwill and courage on the part of a sufficient number of American people that we will avoid that. And that's what keeps me doing this. To answer your question about the universities, I'll be real fast about this. And no one ever speaks about it nationwide. It is the governors who appoint the Board of Regents. Right. It is the governors who appoint the presidents of colleges, universities, just like Nathan Deal appointed Sam Olin as president of Kennesaw. And if he doesn't do it directly, it influences through the Board of Regents, whom he appoints. Appoint the college presidents, who then hire the liberal. And it's this way with the governors nationwide, and no one, no one ever discusses it. It's the governors, and we can hold them accountable, but we don't. You mentioned the very first few sentences you mentioned, 
appointment of uh, in Bill Clinton's case, the appointment of a special attorney, special prosecutor, prosecutor right? Mm -hmm. uh, was that done in this case? Uh, this last impeachment, is there a special prosecutor involved there? No, I mean we had we had Bob Mueller. Uh, well, talking minute, about, we're talking about from for this particular impeachment. No, no. What I'm saying is, we had Bob Mueller initially, and the at the very toward the very end of the House Manager's trial memorandum, they sort of tip their hand. They refer back to Bob Mueller uh, and their need to continue the obstruction that he found, which of course he didn't. Uh, so. They're, they're trying to piggyback on, on his work as the independent counsel. Which so, sorry, no, what they're... is that? Could you say it again, please? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's listening. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Jerry, they, they've heard me before. <laughs> okay, so, so basically, they did not put a, a, a special prosecutor no. in there intentionally so they could control all of the input. Well, uh, a, a, a special prosecutor, uh, you know, is appointed by the executive branch. The legislative branch can't have a separation of powers. That's what I so, so, so it's not their responsibility to appoint that special prosecutor. <laughs> no. But where do they get their power to investigate? They just uh, have a badge that says, uh, "Come on in." Well, it's, it's, there, there are three, three fundamental responsibilities that the Congress has: to legislate to appropriate money, and to conduct oversight in order to ensure that the laws that the Congress passes are being carried out by the executive branch consistent with the explicit and implied intent of the Congress. So it's the, it's the basic oversight responsibility of the Congress. Okay, okay, so I think it's basically, but the most disturbing thing you said, and you're very clear, I love the way you presented this, the, the, the most disturbing thing to me is it's what they're trying to do, an end run around the Constitution and push it off onto the Senate. And this sets a precedence to, 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 to force the Senate. And the Senate sit, sitting there with their big eyes in the headlights <laughs> are sitting there looking at what are we going to do? It's election year. And that's our problem, folks, right there. But, and that's, a, that's another very important distinction uh, between what happened in 1999 yes. and now. We were, it, it was very clear, I mean, Clinton had already won re-election. We weren't trying to influence an election. That's precisely what these Democrats are doing now. They're trying to influence an election of a president who is running for re-election. And that makes what they're doing especially problematic. Uh, um, appreciate your presentation, and you, part of what you said was, you know, we, we don't. The Senate doesn't necessarily need witnesses, and really and truly, um, the Democrats are spending all the time this week making their case. When when they finish making their case, if the Senate decides, okay, we've heard the case, we're ready to acquit. I don't see where that's an issue decide on no witnesses, but if the Senate were to decide, well, look, <coughs> there are these issues relative to impeachment, and we would like to hear witnesses who are relevant to impeachment, okay, that's a perspective also. My concern would be what the Democrats appear to be saying is, okay, we decided on these articles of impeachment, now we're hearing other stuff that we're concerned about that's beyond what we the articles of impeachment we brought, so we want to hear from people like Parnas or whatever, that what they would have to say isn't related to the articles of impeachment. Why should the Senate be hearing testimony that is unrelated to the articles of impeachment that the House brought? That uh, they shouldn't. That would be directly contrary to the responsibility of the Senate. The responsibility of the Senate is not to impeach a president. The responsibility of the Senate is to render its independent judgment on whether the impeachment already passed by the House warrants removal from office. That's the universe of evidence.
that they ought to consider, that they constitutionally are responsible for considering, and anything beyond that is irrelevant, further erodes the principles of impeachment, the process itself, and it's not the job of the Senate to do, to do, to do the job of the House any more than it was the job of the House through this idiotic notion that Nancy Pelosi had that it's her job and responsibility to set the rules in the Senate. We appreciate